Hello and welcome to Gendering Geopolitics, my short series where I have quick 10 minute conversations with women who are doing amazing work around the world. My name is Emily Prey and I'm a senior analyst at the New Lens Institute in Washington, DC. Today I'm speaking with Sana Safi, a senior presenter at the BBC about Afghanistan. Thank you so much for joining me, Sana. Thank you for having me, Emily. So last week, Biden announced that he was going to split the 7 billion US dollars in frozen Afghan central bank funds between Afghans and 9-11 families. Keeping in mind that the Afghan people had nothing to do with 9-11 and that this is their money, why would he do this? And how is this going to affect ordinary Afghans, especially women and children? I guess the question to why is because the Biden administration um, spent months trying to find a way to free some of the assets to go to uh, fulfill the needs of the Afghan population who are going through a crisis right now, a humanitarian crisis. Uh, but also uh, considering the ongoing litigation by uh, families of the uh, uh, victims of 9-11 attacks. So this decision comes after months of um, uh, deliberations, I guess. The total assets, as people might know, 9 billion, uh, 7 billion are in the US, frozen in the US, and others are in Europe and other countries. As you mentioned, Afghans are angry because they argue that this money belonged to the Afghan people and not to the Taliban. No Afghan national was involved in the 9-11 attacks. Uh, the Taliban took over Afghanistan in August uh, 2021 after a deal that was made by the US uh, with the group in 2020. Um, and fourthly, that this money is not for humanitarian aid. It should not be used as a humanitarian aid because these assets are there. They're needed to provide liquidity to the Afghan market. How, I guess, it affects women and children, Afghans tell me that they do not want handouts. They do not want charity. They want an economy that works. They want to find jobs. They want to work and earn money. And they fear that if these assets are going, are going to be used in, in humanitarian, um, for humanitarian purposes, then there will be nothing left for the Afghan economy to, to revive itself, uh, so to speak. And an, an aid dependent Afghanistan, they say, is never is never a good place to be for anybody, let alone a woman or a child. So the effect, I think, is that they're worried this will have long-term effects, which is going to prolong the, the crisis that Afghan women and children are in. Now, looking at the Hazara people, they are particularly at risk of mass atrocities, including genocide. And under the 1948 Genocide Convention, signatories have a legal obligation to act not only to punish, but to prevent genocide from occurring. Do you think, given the situation on the ground for the Hazaras, that the international community has an obligation to intervene? I have familiar relations with the Hazara community, uh, as well as other ethnic, uh, Turkic ethnic groups and the Baloch who are based in the west of Afghanistan. They're also a minority in, in the country. These are because of the marriages of uncles, aunts, cousins, and other relatives, of course. So I'm very well aware of the the, the feelings of um, most of Afghanistan's minority communities. Like every other Afghan, every time I speak to them, they are worried about putting food on the table. They're worried about finding shelter. They're worried about uh, finding safety and security now. But the minority communities, as you mentioned, are also worried about representation and having a future um, in, in um, the, the Afghan society. They want uh, members of the community, including my own family, uh, the members of my own family, they want a future that grants them full rights and represent representation. Um, so I think they, what I'm hearing from them is that they will welcome any um, any genuine efforts to uh, really uh, make sure that their rights are protected, their interests are safeguarded. They don't want, they don't just want to survive. 
they tell me they want to thrive and for any tangible and real change to happen to address those issues i think uh, it's important that uh, those communities are at the heart of any debate um, if they're going to happen in the future or if at the moment there are things um, under consideration so i wouldn't give myself the right to speak on behalf of them i would really say that they should be involved, they should be given the platform to speak for themselves. Now, recently the Taliban have said that they will allow girls to go back to school next month. Do you believe this? What are your thoughts on this? Well, the Taliban promised that secondary schools will open in March for girls uh, in areas that are classified as cold. But then women rights activists and other women that I speak to on my numerous social media accounts as well as chat apps, they tell me that the Taliban, the same Taliban were also saying that they were not holding women rights activists who were arrested uh, in Kabul and other parts of the country for going to the streets to protest for their own rights. And then we saw that the same, some of those women were released um they, they were back at home so women are saying that we just want to wait and see we do not want to be uh, overly helpful uh, but we also don't want to downplay the importance of this announcement so everybody is at the moment uh, waiting to see exactly what happens in march now looking back at the withdrawal in august it was an unmitigated disaster and somehow it has only gotten worse since with the past winter, the humanitarian crisis, the millions and millions of Afghans who are starving every day. What message does this send to US allies that, you know, of what the US is willing to do and who President Biden is willing to help and willing to leave behind? I'll start by saying that the words used by Afghans to describe the decisions of the Biden administration, as well as the previous US administrations in regards to Afghanistan, are betrayal, stabbing the back, kicking the ladder away, pulling the rug under our feet. Now, all countries may have their own policy considerations and they know very well how to approach them. They, of course, are watching the situation and assessing their own circumstances. But I think it's safe to assume that the Afghan experience will definitely remain a reference point for many and for many years to come. And in our last few minutes, the protesters and women's rights activists are increasingly being detained and international pressure doesn't seem to be working. So what are the solutions to this, if there are any solutions? Again, what Afghan women tell me themselves is that we are the victims of male decisions since 1979. First, because of the Soviet invasion, uh, then the U.S. involvement with the Mujahideen and, and uh, in that process. After that, the Taliban government and then the Taliban, uh, the government, then 9-11, post 9-11 U.S. involvement and the Taliban insurgency now back to the Taliban government. They say, look at it. And, and they do really confront me with these things every time I speak to them. They say, look at the situation. You're not blind. Look around. The war machinery is heavily male dominated. Uh, the policy sector, uh, the political arena is, is run by men. M men are calling the shots. The aid sector is really, um, again, uh, in the hands of men. They are making decisions. Why should women pay for the decisions of men? And why should Afghan women pay for the decisions of men who are sitting in DC, London, Doha, and other capitals around the world. They say, Afghan women say, do not talk about us, talk to us, talk with us, involve us, and make us part of the process. And again, I would say for a long-term solution, women in the country need to be listened to, they need to be involved, they need to express what it is that they want themselves and that would work for them. 
again, I'm not in a position to um, offer um, recommendations. I think there are plenty of Afghan women, both inside and outside the country. Everybody has been affected by this conflict in one way or the, or the other. They need to be listened to and they need to be brought to, uh, to, the, to the table uh, and made a part of the conversation. Absolutely. We know that when women are a part of the conversation, that there are more peaceful outcomes and it's more inclusive and it's it's a travesty that, that women are not being involved in these important conversations that directly affect them. Sana, I want to thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for coming on Gendering Geopolitics. I really appreciate your thoughts on, on Afghanistan. Thank you for having me.